The gentleman from Bedford, Mr. Putney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Excuse my vocal cords as usual. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a request and a point of personal privilege. Gentleman has the floor. Um, I'm going to ask the House for unanimous consent to introduce legislation, and that legislation consists of two new budget bills. Several weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, I was humbled by the nice things that were said, all of the kindnesses about my serving in this body about 35, 40 years too long. But as I look back over the years, let me just bore you for a few minutes about the budget process. The changes that have taken place were uh, unbelievable, never imaginable at the time I came here. When I went on the Appropriations Committee in 1966, some of you probably weren't even born, the process for doing the budget was a little bit different. <laughs> Those of us who were junior members were not permitted in the committee room while working on the budget. There were five members of an executive committee that did all of the discussions of the spending proposals, budget amendments, and what have you. And when lesser important items came up, we were invited <laughs> to come into the committee room. But Thank the Lord for the progress and the changes that we have made. In those days, no one was allowed in that room except the five executive committee members and the budget director. <laughs> Quite a change as we move forward. Back in those days, Mr. Speaker, we only met every two years. We did the work, went home. There was no such thing as carryover. <laughs> if the bill didn't pass, it was gone. Changes were being observed and watched all across the country, and Virginia was no exception. It became apparent at least to the leadership in those days, that we needed to consider meeting every year. So in the sweeping amendments to the Constitution that became effective in 1971, I guess one of the most important provisions in it was annual sessions. A number of us did not vote for it. <laughs> And believe it or not, after it occurred, efforts were made to repeal it back to where it was. However, those efforts were not successful. We read all of the bills that came in and we discussed in detail all of the proposals. And much of the new changes took place after going to the annual sessions. The responsibility of the state's finances ultimately and constitutionally belongs to the General Assembly. It's our responsibility to do that. The Constitution is very clear. No money shall be paid out of the state treasury except in pursuance of appropriations by law. And I believe when that language was put in, Mr. Speaker, they were talking about House Bills 30 and 29 that we have acted on this session. As the years passed, 
House of Delegates began to modernize. We thought we'd moved into the 21st century when former delegate Ed Lane, chairman of the Appropriations Committee, hired a couple of people on the staff. We'd never heard of a committee and a General Assembly having a staff. I think all of you will agree that with the competent professional staff that we have, Ed Lane made a very important step forward. The budget was done in the House, was put together, was crafted. After the budget was reported from the House, it went over to the Senate, where they had about five days to look at it and send it back over, and whatever disagreeing versions there were would be assigned to a conference committee. While the Senate never had their own budgets until the 1980s, we have, although they have their own budget, they don't have one now, but when the Senate does have a budget, <laughs> it is always left in the House Appropriations Committee. And the budget that passes and operates the core services of Virginia is always the House budget. That's the vehicle. As many of you know, that's provided for by Constitution in a lot of states, that the budget, the General Appropriations Act, shall originate in the most numerous branch, same as they have in the Congress of the United States. The, uh, there have been occasions, Mr. Speaker, three during my tenure here, where we reached an impasse. In each of those, that between the House and Senate were the two parties who were at loggerheads, that caused the impasse. Despite the impasses, in each case, both bodies adopted their respective budgets and a committee of conference was called to resolve the disagreeing versions. Never have we had a situation in which there was no budget from either chamber to work on. The speaker may be a little bit old fashioned, but I truly believe House of Delegates are duty bound constitutionally and based on our long tradition to have a budget to set up a committee of conference. I don't remember, during the few years that I've been hanging around here, I don't remember ever requesting unanimous consent for the introduction of a bill beyond the deadline for introducing. So I guess this is my first. However, I feel that as chairman of the Appropriations Committee, it's my responsibility, with your consent, to have a 2010-2012 biennium budget and the two-year budget for 2012-2014. The bills are identical, Mr. Speaker, to House Bill 29 and 30. They will be as we voted on those on the floor of this House last Thursday. I would, we could ask His Excellency, I'm sure, to help break the impasse. The governor can send down a bill at any time. But it's clear to me that the responsibility for the budget making, the budget crafting, rests with us, the General Assembly. And I want to thank the gentleman from Charlottesville, the minority leader, for the courtesy he extended to meet with me at my request to discuss what we were planning to do uh, with this request today. And I also want to thank him publicly for the kind words he had with regard to the 
bipartisan fashion in which we went about crafting the, the, the budgets this year. Mr. Speaker, I hope that the body will honor this request for unanimous consent to introduce those bills, and I can assure you that ample time for debate and discussions will be available 